Hey world, Dan Brown here. Welcome to another edition of Tech Deck Deck Tech, the EDH deck building show featuring terrible tricks on a finger skateboard. This week, as I continue to build out this channel, Pogo Back Gaming, more deliberately, like I'm just one person, but the beautiful thing about our format of magic is that it's dynamic, it's constantly changing. People improve as players, decks can get better over time, new cards come out, meta games evolve, so we're gonna be revisiting an old favorite, and that is Alicia, who smiles at death. <laughs> Is it Alesha, Alicia? People always tell me I'm saying it wrong no matter how I say it. So I've named this one Alicia, okay? So a quick refresher on Alicia. Hey, there she is, a 3-2 with first strike um, for three mana, two and a red. And whenever she attacks, you may pay hybrid mana, black, white, black, white, so two mana total. If you do, return target creature card with power two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, tapped and attacking. The last time I walked you through my Alicia deck, it was a hybrid between Alicia and an underperforming Doretti Scrap Savant deck that I had. There's a lot of overlap. Right? She likes to bring back creatures from the graveyard. Doretti likes to bring back artifacts, and there are many you know, artifact creatures that they both work with. So, But it wasn't my most competitive build. The artifact sub-theme was probably a little bit greedy, to be honest, and I tried to you know, fix it by shoehorning in even more things that pulled it in even more disparate directions, and it just kind of stopped working entirely. So I sidelined Alicia, played other decks for a while, and I came back to it once I discovered Puka Trade, actually. I've got to say, of my competitive decks, she is consistently the most fun because she's toolboxy. I can play whatever sort of game I want to. And uh, she's also like a death by a thousand cuts, very low mana curve. I'm doing lots of things on my turn. My board interacts with itself, lots of interactions between zones and lots of interactions with what our opponents are doing. There's just a lot going on. So without further ado, let's start with some bad tech deck tricks and the mana base. This Alicia build uh, runs 38 lands, which uh, with the partial Paris, I would say is right in the sweet spot for most decks. But post partial Paris PPP um, is a little light for most decks. I would edge closer to 40, except Alicia's curve is pretty low, and despite her colors, we do have quite a few ways to ramp in this build. These are all basics. Um, then we have Shizo Death's Storehouse, which is a way to grant Alicia fear. I mean, often we'll be swinging at an open opponent, but in case we need to get her through without, you know, her dying to some blocker, this uh, enables her to be mostly unblockable. Um, then we just have basic, you know, color fixing lands. These filter lands are good for getting Alicia's trigger, even with red mana. Cavern of Souls is just great utility against control decks. We name a creature type when it enters, and whenever we use mana from this to cast a creature of that type, that creature can't be countered. Alicia's a human warrior, and we're always naming human. There are a few more humans in the deck. Command Beacon was printed in Commander 2015, and I'll often joke to my opponents that Alicia really does smile at death. We will often attack with Alicia into what we know to be a lethal blocker just to get her reanimation trigger. So her cost goes up relatively quickly, um, and when she costs 7, 9, 11, 13, mana, Command Beacon becomes very much worth it. Core Haven is wonderful in any deck that runs white. It's a fog on a stick, and we never obstruct our board, but often opponents just don't look carefully at the lands that we have in play, and we can get away with, you know, fogging their Blightsteel Colossus without them realizing that that was a play available to us. Finally, we have Opal Palace. Um, we can use it to add a colorless or to filter any color of mana, and if we use that to cast our commander, it enters the battlefield with plus one, plus one counters equal to the number of times it has been and cast from the command zone. And that is particularly relevant in a deck with a combat-based commander, and when that commander has first strike. There are a whole lot more creatures that die to a, you know, 5-4 first strike than do to a 3-2 first strike. I'll tell you, the longer I play this format, the more mana producers I include in all of my decks, particularly with the new Vancouver Mulligan, which makes it harder to hit all of your land drops or mana rocks. And even in a deck with a, a pretty low curve, I have 38 lands plus 11 mana rocks. That means half of the deck is just to make mana. Now let's get into it. We have a Soul Ring, Marble Diamond, Charcoal Diamond, Star Compass. I hadn't heard of this card. I don't know why, but it taps uh, for any color that a basic land you control could produce and only costs two. Two mana mana rocks are wonderful. It's like a Farseek without green. Um, Felwar Stone, same thing. Rakdos Signet, Orzhov Signet, Boros Signet, Talisman of Indulgence. Those are all my two and one mana mana rocks. Then I have a Palladium Mirror, which is a Soul Ring with legs that costs three. I just include it because if it ever dies for some reason, I can reanimate it with Alicia. 
Militia. And Hedron Archive, I think this card belongs in many, many, many commander decks. Four mana for a soul ring, but it, for two mana and sacrifice it, draw two cards. I mean, in a pinch, those two cards can be the difference between winning and losing. Including lots of removal in your decks is kind of like eating lots of vegetables. You know it's good for you, it's going to win you more games, but it's hard to do when you're deck building because they're cards that in the abstract uh, don't relate to whatever you're trying to accomplish with your commander, whatever you're trying to build around. They're just designed to deal with other threats that, you know, don't exist in the deck building stage, right? That said, it's a little easier in Alicia because black and white are far and away the best colors for removal. So this is just kind of like a greatest hits of EDH removal spells. Swords, Path, Tragic Slip is nice because we have creatures that we want to put back in the graveyard and sack outlets, so we can almost always get the minus 13, minus 13. Terminate, Ablation, Chaos Warp, Mortify, Unmake, uh, Sudden Spoiling will save your ass. Run this in any deck that can run it when an opponent tries to you know, combo off. Oops, all zero twos, no time to respond. Um, Utter End is a little mana intensive, but it deals with any threat. I really like the card. Um, and Wretched Confluence, the entire Confluence cycle is off the chain, and in my opinion, this is the best one. It's kind of close between Wretched and Mystic, the, the blue one, but, you know, we can draw a card and lose a life, or give a creature minus two, minus two, or return a creature card from our graveyard to our hand. Those are all perfectly relevant in Alicia, and we could have any combination of the three three times. So this is 11 removal spells, which in most decks I consider to be just a little bit light. I like to be in, you know, the 15 to 16 range, but this is a very fast deck that does many things and has a pretty consistent draw engine. We can keep our opponents on their heels with our board state and hold up one, maybe two removal spells per turn cycle and normally play uh, a pretty involved game with that. Speaking of our pretty consistent draw engine, how about that? That was a pretty good little tech deck trick there. <laughs> uh, we have a skull clamp. Honestly, not that many X1s in the deck, but with sack outlets, we still get plenty of value off of this. Um, Wheel of Fortune. I mean, Alicia obviously doesn't care uh, that our creatures wind up in the graveyard, so Wheel of Fortune disproportionately helps us out. Not to mention that, you know, any global effect, as long as you have your finger on the button, is an advantage for you, just because you can time it conveniently. Underworld Connections and uh, Phyrexian Arena. I mean, this is basically a slightly worse version of Phyrexian in, uh, arena, but they allow us to, you know, draw an extra card every turn, which in these colors, if we're top decking, we're normally doing better than opponents who are top decking, right? Black is very good at that. White is very good at that. And then uh, we have a tutor package also. Demonic Tutor. Diabolic Intent is just a Demonic Tutor reprint, but also requires you to sacrifice a creature. But that's a feature, not a bug in Alicia, right? We sack our Solemn Simulacrum and then can reanimate it to Alicia in lieu of any other um, sack outlet. And then Dark Petition. This is one of my favorite cards from Origins. Again, it's just another Demonic Tutor. It costs five, but if you have Spell Mastery to instance or sorceries in your graveyard, it rituals. And then effectively, it costs the same as a Demonic Tutor. And often in Alicia, when we cast a toot, we're tooting for another toot, specifically a graveyard toot tutor, uh, <laughs> in tomb, or is m m optimally buried alive. This much has not changed from the artifact build. Buried alive is still the most important card in the deck. We can search our library for either one card or three creature cards and put them in our graveyard, um, which sets us up for, you know, Alicia first of all, but also reanimate, um, animate dead, dance of the dead, necromancy, dread return, or unburial rites. They're all just cards that you know, bring things back from the dead. In my first Alicia builds, I didn't include nearly as many of these effects because, you know, in my mind, the way I was looking at it back then was, well, we already have Alicia, so aren't these effects redundant? But there are a few problems with that way of thinking. I mean, first of all, we can't always depend on Alicia being available or having haste or, you know, being able to attack for, you know, some reason on the board. And also, we can only really use Alicia once every turn, and sometimes we want or even need to reanimate more than one thing per turn. By the mid or late game, these aren't reanimation spells so much as they are the best utility cards in the deck. If we have a stacked graveyard full of options, we can use these to do whatever the situation calls for. Which brings us to the creatures we might actually want to reanimate with those effects or with Alicia herself. First of all um, is Grand Abolisher, which I'm actually on the fence about. It's very 
metagame dependent. In a control-heavy meta, I like it a lot. It prevents our opponents from interrupting us as we're trying to combo off and win the game. But other than that, it's kind of a dead draw. It's just a 2-2, and sure, it does lock our opponents out from interrupting with us just during a more normal turn, but like I said, Alicia is a death by a thousand cuts sort of commander, and if all we're doing is ramping once, playing a mana rock, drawing a few cards, none of those are back-breaking, game-changing sorts of effects that opponents tend to want to stop. So in my meta, I still think it's worth it. But Mirror Entity. Okay, Alicia normally wins by going infinite with Karmic Guide and Revel Arc, but this serves as an alternate win condition. We can flood the board with creatures, reanimate this, and turn all of our creatures into 10-10s before damage. Or, speaking of Karmic Guide and Revel Arc, Mirror Entity, in lieu of a better sack outlet, can actually put infinite of its abilities, X ability on the stack for zero? <laughs> and that works to create infinite ETBs uh, with Karmic Guide and Revel Arc. I'll explain that in a minute. I don't love Burnished Heart as much as I love a, say, Solemn Simulacrum plus a Sack Outlet, but the good thing about this card is it doesn't need anything other than, you know, itself and Alicia uh, to start ramping you very quickly. Every turn you can, you know, crack it, sacrifice it, reanimate it with Alicia and do the same thing over and over again with more lands to spare each time. Anger, we're never we're actually reanimating this. We're putting it in the graveyard with Buried Alive and leaving it there so that whenever Alicia dies, uh, she can come back swinging uh, ASAP. <laughs> Falcon Wrath Noble, I tend to just view this as a combo piece. Once we have infinite death triggers from Karmic Guide and Revel Arc, this is the finisher. But there are some corner cases where we're in the danger zone in terms of life total, and the board is flooded with lots of creatures, and we do run one board wipe in this deck. So if we get Falcon Wrath in play and then wipe the board, we can, you know, fix ourselves when it comes to life and maybe even knock out an opponent or at least severely cripple them. Solemn Simulacrum is an all star in our format, you know, regardless regardless of what deck you play, but in Alicia, I mean, is the best creature to reanimate during the mid-game. An ideal mid-game is attack with Alicia, reanimate Solemn, ramp one during the last opponent's end step before ours, sacrifice the Solemn, draw an extra card, reanimate it again. It's just, it's so much value. Alternatively, you can take turns reanimating Solemn one turn and then Disciple of Bolus on the next turn, sacrificing your Solemn, drawing two cards and gaining two life and drawing one card for Solemn's trigger. I, 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 so good. Alicia is the master of these plays that aren't backbreaking. They don't set off alarms where opponents think that they have to deal with you immediately. But if you can just do this every single turn consistently, you're going to win the game. Anarchist is just really good for returning a Buried Alive or Demonic Tutor to our hand. Ponyback Brigade, I, I view pretty much as an alternate win condition. If, say, someone exiles a vital combo piece, then we just need to flood the board with creatures and win with a Mirror Entity or a Cathar's Crusade. And of course, we have Karmic Guide, which when it enters the battlefield, reanimates another creature from our graveyard. So we can go for the value play and get a Rune Scarred Demon, which is a 6 6 flying beater with a demonic tutor ETB. Or we can go for the win with uh, Revel Arc, which creates an infinite loop. I did mention earlier that this combo is possible without a sack outlet if instead uh, you have a mirror entity. Um, <laughs> this is weird, but let me walk you through it. So we attack with Alicia, we pay for her trigger, we bring back a Karmic Guide, tapped and attacking, trigger on. Karmic Guide, we will bring back Revel Arc. Okay, hold on to your pants. We're going to put infinite abilities on the stack for Mirror Entity, making my creatures 0-0 zero, zero changelings until end of turn. We're going to let the first one of those resolve, which will kill all of my creatures. They become 0-0s. Zero, zero. At least I'll go back to the command zone. These will die, and Revel Arc will die. Trigger on Revel Arc. We get to bring back two creatures. One of them will be a Karmic Guide, and one of them will be a Falcon Wrath Noble. Trigger on Karmic Guide. We're going to bring back the Revel Arc, um, and then we're going to let the next Mirror Entity ability resolve, which will kill my creatures again. This time, Falcon Wrath Noble will trigger three times, and then uh, Revel Arc will trigger again for leaving the battlefield, and we will bring back these two again. Bring back the Revel Arc. Let the next mirror entity ability resolve. They'll die again, and we will do it infinite times until our opponents are super dead. That primary win condition is obviously a lot easier when we actually have a sack outlet. So here are our deck sacrifice outlets. We have a Viscera Seer, which lets us scry one. It's a free sack outlet. Vampiric Rites is not a free sack outlet. It has an activation cost of two, so it would not work for the Karmic Guide Revel Arc combo, but it's just excellent value. It lets us set up reanimation with Alicia, and it draws us a card and gains us 
a life. Too good to pass up. Goblin Bombardment is fantastic. It is a free sack outlet, and uh, with Karmic Guide Revel Arc, we don't even need another finisher, because this is our finisher. It deals one damage to target creature or player. Phyrexian Altar, this one is in French, so <laughs> might not understand it, but just sack a creature, add one mana of any color to your mana pool, and Cartel Aristocrat, free sack outlet, gains protection from the color of your choice. Basically, it's a sack outlet that we can recur with Alicia should she die. And Maw of the Obsidot, another free sack outlet that also serves as a, a kind of alternate win condition. Sack a creature and creatures I control get plus one plus one. So if we have flooded the board with the Ponyback Brigade, sack enough of those to make the rest of them huge. It, you know, you get it. Finally, uh, we have a pile of cards here that just don't quite fit into any other category. First of all is Reconnaissance. This is an enchantment for one and has an activation cost of zero. Remove target attacking creature you control from combat and untap it. Now, when they printed this card, the intention, I'm pretty sure, was to, you know, always prevent the damage that that creature would deal, but either they overlooked the rules or the rules changed, I'm not 100% sure. There is technically an end of combat step where damage has already occurred, but your creatures are still considered, you know, quote, attacking creatures. So it, it's pseudo-vigilance. A creature can attack, deal damage, and then at end of combat, boom, untap it and remove it from combat, question mark. But even if you could only use reconnaissance as originally intended, it would still be worth including in Alicia because if all of our opponents had big fat blockers, we could still swing with Alicia, get her trigger, reanimate something, and then pull her and the reanimated creature out of combat before they were killed by blockers. Lightning Greaves just makes sense. Sort of the Animist. I've sung this card's praises in my Zada deck tech. Basically, we're living the dream. If we have Alicia, we have her equipped with Sword of the Animist. We attack, we get a trigger off of this. We search for a basic. Uh, we have a trigger on Alicia. We pay for it and reanimate Solemn. We search for another basic. We're ramping two basic lands every turn in a non-green deck. Not to mention that this grants plus one, plus one on our first strikey commander, making her that much harder to block and kill. Eldrazi Monument is a card I honestly hadn't considered until it was <laughs> reprinted in the most recent commander set, but it fits into Alicia so nicely, giving her flying and indestructible and plus one plus one, not to mention all of the you know creatures we're likely to have on our board, and sacrificing a creature at the beginning of our upkeep, we really don't mind that. That's a feature, not a bug. It lets us sack our Solemn, get it back in our graveyard, ready to reanimate again. Cathar's Crusade sometimes requires more dice uh, than we have on hand. The arithmetic can get a little out of hand, but I referenced it before. It's basically a backup win condition in case someone exiles uh, a combo piece. And finally, um, Decree of Pain. I like every deck of mine to have at least one reset button, and this one gets us tons of value. It's destroy all creatures that can't be regenerated. Draw a card for each creature destroyed this way. I mean, it's eight mana. It's mana intensive, but if we're swinging in, reanimating Solemn, have some mana rocks, we can hit eight mana no problem. Yeah, let me shuffle up, and uh, we'll goldfish a hand here. Woo. Oh, look, one basic land of every type. That is... I think it's a pretty strong opening. The hand doesn't have a ton of direction to it, but we know we're going to hit Alicia on curve and probably be on curve up until we hit our five drop Eldrazi monument, by which point maybe we will have drawn into something we can sack to the monument and keep bringing into the battlefield. So I think we're going to rock with this. So turn one, we're probably hoping for a mana rock here. We have a reanimate that's interesting. We'll play a swamp just in case the opponent put a creature in a graveyard. Probably didn't happen already, but we'll take our uh, second turn here. Turn two, it will draw. Swords to Plowshares, never a bad thing to have. Probably a good time to drop our planes. And we will move to turn three. We will draw another land, that's good news. We'll play our mountain, and for three, we will cast our commander, Alicia. It's worth noting that even without anything in our graveyard, Alicia is a very strong early game blocker. There are often easier opponents to attack than the one with the 3-2 first strike. Move to turn four here. We will draw an Entomb. Perfect timing. We're going to play a Shizo Death's Storehouse, and then for a black, we're gonna fire off this Entomb. We're gonna grab our Solemn Simulacrum, put it in our graveyard, swing with Alicia, pay for the trigger, reanimate the Solemn, and search for a basic, or it's, it's happening. We tutored for a planes, it'll come into play tapped, and that's it for turn four. Oh, Plenty Mer, sure. I think the best play right now, we might be leaving ourselves a little bit vulnerable, if the board is scary, we might hold up a Swords to Plowshares after casting the Palladium Mirror instead. But if the board's not too crazy, um, for five, we definitely cast the Eldrazi Monument, which will put Solemn in our graveyard at the beginning of our next upkeep. So turn six, we will sacrifice Solemn to the Eldrazi Monument, uh, drawing us an extra card. We got an Anger, not quite what we want to see. Draw another card for turn, an Utter End. Okay, not a terrible thing. We're going to move to combat, swing with a 
4-3 Flying Indestructible Alicia. We have a trigger. We will pay white and, let's say, a non-basic black to return the Solemn to search for another basic land. Put a Swamp into play tapped. Then we're faced with a choice. We can either tap out to cast Palladium Mirror, dropping us down to seven cards in hand and providing us with lots of mana for our next turn, or we can hold up um, our Swords to Plowshares as an answer uh, and stick with eight cards in our hand, forcing a discard of the Anger, which we want in the graveyard. I think that's um, what I would rather do. I'm gonna discard the anger and let's say someone does try to come at us while we're tapped out and we're going to swords their threat to turn seven we're going to untap we got our black sources there white sources there during our upkeep we're going to sacrifice solemn to the eldrazi monument drawing us a card reflecting pool that's good news we're going to draw a card for turn Felwer Stone, also good news. We're going to play the Reflecting Pool as our land for turn. And then I think for one, two, three, um, play a hasty Palladium Mirror because we put Anger in our yard last turn. Then for probably one, two, we'll drop a Felwer Stone like so. And then I gotta think about this. I don't love that we won't have enough mana left to hold up the utter end, but an indestructible flying Palladium Mirror 3-3 three, three blocker isn't terrible. So we're going to move to combat. We're going to swing with Alicia. We're going to pay for her trigger. And we're once again going to bring back the Solemn searching for another land. We'll say a planes. Turn eight, we're going to <laughs> untap. We'll sacrifice our Solemn once again, drawing us an extra card, a flooded strand. Then we're going to draw for turn. It's going to be a decree of pain. Very interesting. We're going to play a flooded strand for our turn, and then we're going to tink for a minute. At this point, the correct play is entirely contingent on whatever our hypothesis hypothetical opponents would be doing. So let's just do some shenanigans. I'm going to tap for one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven, eight, let's say. And we are going to cast the Decree of Pain. Our creatures are indestructible, so we get off the hook. But let's say we draw uh, six cards. Let's say our opponents have conservatively six creatures on the battlefield. Rugged Prairie, Cavern of Souls, Terminate, Wheel of Fortune, Oblation, Vampiric Rites. Eh. If we assume that our opponents are going to have to rebuild after our Decree of Pain, I don't think we need to worry about holding up too many answers. So we'll swing with Alicia. We will pay for Alicia's trigger. We will return a Solemn Simulacrum. And to save time, we're going to crack the Flooded Strand while we're resolving this trigger so our opponents don't hate us. So we have a Swamp, the Lenter tapped, a Godless Shrine. Yeah, why bother taking the shock? Then we'll tap the Reflecting Pool to cast our Vampiric Rites, just to have one fewer card in our hand to discard. Cavern, the Falcon Wrath Noble, and the Mirror Entity, because those can be reanimated anyway. So I'm not going to play through turn nine. I'm going to stop there. But, you know, we, we sack the Solemn. We draw two cards for turn. We have a Revel Arc. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen mana available to us. Uh, hopefully you understand that we're in pretty good shape here, not to mention that we have you know, three answers in our hand to whatever our opponents try to do. Um, feeling pretty good about this game of magic. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. Leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. There's more Pogobat gaming content to check out that away. Uh, I would particularly point you in the direction of the new EDH gameplay podcast. I started with a few of my friends just last week. And if you've been enjoying Pogobat or Pogobat gaming for a while now, I would encourage you to contribute just a dollar a month on Patreon. It goes a long way towards making sure that this whole YouTube enterprise uh, is sustainable, that I can keep making videos and eating food and paying rent. So thank you in advance, and I'll see you next Thursday. I'm pointing at you. Awkwardly.